Tonight, Osama bin Laden claims responsibility for the Christmas Day bomb attempt and is threatening more attacks against U.S. targets. I'm Russ Mitchell. Also tonight, after a bad week politically, the White House says the president gets the message and will focus on jobs and the economy. Chrysler and GM car dealers fight back to save their businesses and jobs. And some are calling it a candy catastrophe. Why the British don't think the Cadbury sale is so sweet. Well, I feel strongly about it. It's not an American company. It's part of Britain. This is the CBS Evening News with Russ Mitchell. And good evening. We begin tonight with the latest words from Osama bin Laden. In a tape released today, the al-Qaeda leader claims responsibility for the Christmas Day terror attack, and experts say the tape promises more. Randall Pinkston reports. In the message, bin Laden addresses the presidents with an odd familiarity. From Osama to Obama. It was brief, one minute, and almost personal. A tape believed to be the voice of Osama bin Laden addressing President Obama and endorsing Christmas plane bomber Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalib as a hero. Analysts say it does not matter to bin Laden that the attempt in Detroit by an al-Qaeda affiliate failed. Even though they did not kill anybody, they, they see it as a big propaganda coup. They were in the media again, um, and um, they were, if you like, terrorizing people again. The message is... Bin Laden's audio message, one of more than 30 since al-Qaeda's 9-11 attacks, comes at a time of heightened security in the U.S. and the United Kingdom. What is particularly troubling for analysts is bin Laden's use of language that preceded other attacks. May peace be on those who follow the light of guidance. This phrase, which appears at the beginning and the end of the message, only appears in bin Laden's statements, typically in messages that come in advance of an attack. Uh, now, this could be in the coming weeks, or it could be as far out as 12 or 14 months from now. Bin Laden issued that same threat warning in the months before the London train bombing in 2005 and the Danish embassy attack in Islamabad in 2008. America will never dream of living in peace unless we live it in Palestine. In his latest message, bin Laden focused on a familiar theme, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, with no reference to America's main military engagements. This is a message for the American people. This is a, a message that unless you change your foreign policy, we're going to continue attacking you. No matter what bin Laden says, his messages always serve as a recruiting tool for radicals. As far as endorsing the Detroit attack, a State Department spokesman says it's bin Laden's effort to stay relevant from wherever he's hiding, Russ. Randall Pinkston, thank you very much. After a brutal week for the White House, the Obama administration is vowing to start turning things around with voters this week. This following that stunning Democratic Senate defeat in Massachusetts last Tuesday and the results of a new poll that shows 63 percent of Americans think the country is seriously off track. Senior White House correspondent Bill Plant has more. The President of the United States. In the State of the Union address President Obama will deliver Wednesday, he'll be seeking to reconnect with the millions of Americans who voted for change but didn't see it in his first year. He's on the cover of two news magazines this week, one asking the question, now what? The loss of a Democratic Senate seat in Massachusetts set off the alarm. A Washington Post poll shows almost two-thirds of those who voted for Republican Scott Brown said they opposed the Democrats' agenda. The president's advisor said today he got the message and that his State of the Union speech will focus on jobs and the economy. I think the president will go through a series of things. Uh, how do we continue to work to get our economy back on track? Uh, how do we put uh, uh, Main Street in, uh, in better shape? The long debate in Washington about health care may have been a turnoff for voters. If you look at the polls out of Massachusetts, people reacted as much to the process uh, as anything else. Were there things we could have done there? Perhaps. We have to think that through. One part of thinking it through may be the decision to ask political advisor David Plouffe, one of the architects of Mr. Obama's 2008 victory, to oversee Democrats' campaign strategy for the November midterm elections. In today's Washington Post, Plouffe writes, if Democrats do what the American people sent them to Washington to do, November will be nothing like the nightmare the talking heads have forecast. But advisors were quick to insist today that rumors of a major White House staff shakeup are overblown. Hey, Washington loves the when are we going to throw a body out a story. That's not how we roll. In his State of the Union speech, the president will try to recapture the narrative. 
He'll talk about a new foundation for the country, rescue, restore, and rebuild. And he'll say that health care reform isn't dead. Russ? Well, Bill, based on your experience, do you get the sense that there is a panic at the White House? I wouldn't call it panic, Russ, but there's a distinct shift in tone. On Wednesday, you could feel it here. Instead of joking around, the press secretary was dead serious. And you could hear it all week in the president's speech, particularly in the speech he made Friday in Ohio, where he said, I won't rest until I get jobs for everyone. Bill Plant at the White House, thank you very much. And now to Haiti, the Haitian-born recording star Wyclef Jean arrived in Port-au-Prince today to help publicize the relief effort. He handed out cooked food for immediate consumption to survivors. I've cried for two days, right? And after I've cried, you see what I did. I didn't cry for myself. I told y'all, I cried for my people. And I said, quit moving, meaning it's time to get back to work. Wyclef Jean helped organize and appeared on last Friday's Hope for Haiti fundraising telethon. And Haiti was hit with another aftershock today. This one, a 5.5, was considered moderate. No damage has been reported. As the estimated death toll from the 7.0 quake nearly two weeks ago, now at 200,000, continues to rise, cries of faith and hope continue to be heard in Haiti. Bill Whitaker has more. You'd hardly blame Haitians for cursing their misfortune. But on this second Sunday, after the walls came tumbling down, they sang songs of praise in the rubble of the main cathedral. The wall of this church collapsed, so they prayed on the lawn, having endured 12 days of death and deliverance. Haitians have cheered the miracles of people being pulled from the rubble 9, 10, 11 days after the earthquake. But what they could use now is a chorus of angels. We found one today, Madame Yolaine Batroni. She lost four family members in the quake, her house is unlivable, yet she gives. How many people do you have sleeping here? About between 80 and 100. Young, old, camped in her backyard. Yolen, her husband Patrick, and two children sleep outside too. Both have good jobs, well to do in this neighborhood, but far from wealthy, they're digging into their pockets to buy water and food for their invited guests. Has any of the aid that's coming through the airport come to you? No, they don't know our existence. So her family in the U.S. is seeking donations on Facebook. And Yolen? And I'm waiting for my paycheck. Waiting for her paycheck so she can do more. Rodney Jozon said if it weren't for her, he and his family would be in the streets. Why do it? It's how she was raised, she says, and of course, the children. Kids are kids no matter what color they are and what country they are from. Look at them, they're playing. The deads are dead. Do nothing for them. We have to think of the lives. Haitians now are living on faith, hope, and charity, and the kindness of some angels. Russ, Bill, we heard your story from Yulan, of course, who said she is still not getting the help that she feels should be coming her way. At this point, nearly two weeks after the quake, what seems to be the problem? Well, there has been a log jam. More aid coming into this airport than it can handle or the small roads around here. But we have seen signs that the, the log jam is breaking, that the food is now beginning to get out into the city and into the countryside. Russ? That is good news. Bill Whitaker in Port-au-Prince. Thank you very much. And coming up on tonight's CBS Evening News, never have so many candy bars meant so much to England. But next, thousands of jobs rest in the balance a last chance to save some local auto dealers. Walmart said today it is cutting more than 11,000 workers at its Sam's Club stores. That is 10% of the division's workforce. Most are part-timers who demonstrate products. And America's auto dealers are fighting back against Chrysler and GM. Thousands who had their franchises revoked have until midnight tomorrow to request binding arbitration and a chance to stay in business. Well, Gallegos has more. But I see ghosts. This should be a vibrant, active shop. When Jim Andera looks around at what used to be his Chrysler Jeep dealership, he gets angry. I made money every year in business, every month in business. After 22 years in the New York suburbs, Andera was given a month by Chrysler last year to shut down. One of 789 dealerships eliminated by the struggling automaker. 65 employees lost their jobs. A bad blow 
for this community, for my employees, to myself financially. 2,000 General Motors dealers have been notified they are being phased out this October. And we're still dumbfounded. Third generation car dealer David Karp was stunned when GM pulled the plug on his Buick franchise. He is a national top seller with awards from GM to prove it. Our customers appreciate what we do. And up until recently, I thought that General Motors appreciated what we did. Carp and Andura, along with 1,200 other dealers, have signed up for arbitration before an independent panel. They will find out within six months whether they get to keep selling the cars they have always sold. They're really going to feel that they got a chance to be heard, and they got a chance to be heard in less than two and a half years in the court system. Dealer profits and sales are not the only factors being considered. The American Arbitration Association will also look at the number of dealers in an area and the automaker's plans to cut costs. GM tells CBS News consolidating its dealer network was one of the most painful aspects of its restructuring process. And Chrysler says it stands by the criteria used to evaluate its dealers. I absolutely want my dealership back. I don't want to use the word demand, but I, but I do. I demand my dealership back. And there is one sign of hope coming from GM's CEO and chairman, who said recently that he expects hundreds of dealers to win back their franchises during the arbitration process. Manuel Gallegas, CBS News, New York. I have next on tonight's CBS Evening News. It is not just Google that's been attacked in China. It's many U.S. businesses. Stay with us. On this Sunday, it was football heavyweights squaring off against each other. But in cyberspace, there's a heavyweight battle pitting China against Google, as well as, it turns out, many other American businesses. John Blackstone reports. At first, it seemed to be a cyber attack aimed at those who organized protests against China's control of Tibet. After the saying in our community that if you're not being watched by the Chinese government, you're probably not doing the best you can. Still, Tenzin Selden, a student at Stanford, was surprised when Google told her someone in China was reading her email. Hackers had to use some sort of high-tech um, things that could, they, that, that, that could, they could have access to my um, password. But Google discovered this was much more than an attack on the email of a single Chinese human rights activist. Not only was Google itself targeted by the cyber spies, but so were at least 20 other major corporations. This is not a Google story. It's a story about industrial espionage coming from China, attacking American business and our economy. Peter Navarro, author of The Coming China War, says the companies believed to have been attacked include Dow Chemical and Northrop Grumman. And they hack American business enterprises. It's a covert act of war on our, on our economy at a time when their economy is growing at 10 percent and we have over 10 percent on unemployment rate. At a place where they battle hackers every day, the computer security company McAfee, George Kurtz says the attacks were sophisticated and precisely targeted. Designed to get in, co cover its tracks, steal data and corporate secrets, and get out. And for the companies involved, those secrets are valuable. Think about the amount of money they spend in R&D on a yearly basis, billions of dollars. Having these very sensitive uh, trade secrets and intellectual property and potentially source code taken uh, can be very damaging to them. One of the huge drivers of Chinese economic growth over the last several decades has been the forced technology transfer uh, of, from America to China. Well, there's no proof the Chinese government itself was involved in the attacks, Tenzin Selden says American companies hoping to profit in China should beware. It's not them that has owned China. It's ch China has owned them. As others now look to protect themselves from Chinese hackers, China itself strictly censors the Internet behind what's been called the Great Firewall. John Blackstone, CBS News, Mountain View, California. Coast Guard crews today tried to contain an oil spill near Port Arthur, Texas. As much as 462,000 gallons of oil may have spilled in the collision between a tanker and another vessel. And so ahead on tonight's CBS Evening News, scrambling to prevent Haiti's earthquake orphans from abuse. A group of 83 orphans from Haiti arrived in Orlando, Florida this weekend to meet with the parents who plan to adopt them. They came from an orphanage that CBS News went to last weekend. And concerns are growing about the well-being of the orphans who remain in Haiti, as Seth Doan reports. At just eight years old, Wilson Bonneau is all alone. 
Both of his parents were killed in the earthquake. What goes through your mind when you think about them? I miss them a lot, he tells me. I used to cry all the time. Now the streets of Port-au-Prince are his home, a filthy fountain his bath, and this his bed. Can you show me how you sleep when you sleep at night? Early like estimates that? by the United Nations suggest, like Wilson, there could be up to 60,000 children who were killed, separated from their families, or orphaned by the earthquake. And aid organizations are scrambling to prevent these kids from being abused, exploited, or illegally adopted. We have heard reports of children being uh, taken out of the country, and UNICEF is very concerned about this. Children are the most vulnerable in any disaster. Kate Conrad is with the aid group Save the Children. They've called for a halt to new adoptions until it can be verified that these children are indeed orphans. We don't believe that every unaccompanied child is an orphan, and it's really important that we don't take children out of the country if their parents or families are here and they're desperately searching for them. It's believed there are around 200 orphanages in the capital city. Some simply cannot accept any more children. Why don't you go to an orphanage? I would love to go to an orphanage, Wilson tells me, but sometimes the place is occupied and I'll go sleep in the grass. Like so many here after the earthquake, Wilson is left to fend for himself. Seth Jones, CBS News, Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And coming up on tonight's CBS Evening News, we'll change directions and tell you what's got the British crying in their candy bar. The sci-fi blockbuster Avatar has become an unstoppable force here and around the world. Avatar made another $36 million, beginning the weekend box office for the sixth week in a row. Worldwide, Avatar has taken in more than $1,840 million and soon will leave Titanic in its wake as the biggest international moneymaker ever. The British are digesting the news that its biggest candy maker is about to be swallowed up by an American company after a bitter takeover battle. As Elizabeth Palmer tells us from London, the sale of Cadbury to Kraft is seen as an attempt to consume Britain's identity. The love affair with Cadbury's chocolate starts for most Britons in childhood, and the passion never leaves them. I love chocolate. <laughs> I eat Cadbury's chocolate every day. Everyone's got a favorite bar. Dairy milk? Fruit and nuts. Always fast. Cadbury's was established more than a century ago by two Quaker brothers. Two Victorian businessmen once had a strangely un-Victorian idea. The founders promised fair treatment for employees and even built their factory out in the country where workers could enjoy space and fresh air. When Kraft, the U.S. food conglomerate, moved to take over Cadbury, it thought it was just bidding on a chocolate company. Cadbury's Flint the least expensive luxury imaginable. It hadn't factored in this kind of history and nostalgia, not to mention some prickly national pride. I would say, how would you feel if we came and took Hershey? The craft takeover has got people worried about job losses at Cadbury, but it also comes at a sensitive time for British industry as a whole. There have been a lot of takeovers of UK companies in the last few years, not just by Americans, but by Europeans, Indian companies, Chinese companies, and there's a lot of concern that we are, quote, losing too many of our companies. Some of the greatest British icons have been sold abroad. Jaguar, Rolls-Royce, Harrods, and the great Manchester United soccer team bought by the American billionaire Malcolm Glazer. Now Kraft is poised to become the latest foreign owner of a beloved British brand by coming up with enough cash to convince shareholders that sweet as Cadbury's past was, its future will be even richer when it makes Kraft the biggest candy maker in the world. Elizabeth Palmer, CBS News, London. And that is the CBS Evening News. Later tonight on CBS, 60 Minutes. Thanks for joining us this Sunday evening. I'm Russ Mitchell, CBS News in New York. Katie's here tomorrow. Good night.